Exactly, Yvonne. So it's actually uh, been wondered about for a while what NASA is going to do. And you're absolutely right. It's been commissioned till 2024. And we're sort of fingers crossed that we can get the five uh, space uh uh, organisations that are involved in the ISS to say yes to another six-year extension. Of course, one of those is is Roscosmos, which is Russia. And given the current political situation, nothing's for certain. So it's fingers crossed we can um, keep that going until 2030. Uh, and look, no, NASA has been aware of the need to transition to new space station platforms and other modes of transport to low Earth platforms for quite some time. I think we've discussed several times the likes of Blue Origin and Elon Musk and all that sort of thing. So they're quite aware and they've really only just decided with the report that came out how to do it and when they're going to do it. So they're going to move this 400 tonne ISS station. So it's actually been built from like 1998 and little bits have been added over the last 20 so or so years. So it's huge now. It's in it's 400 kilometres up. It'll need oh, probably uh, several visiting spacecraft to actually help it to come down. And we need to make sure we're doing this in a controlled manner because 1979 Skylab, NASA's Skylab just fell out of the sky essentially. It fell out of orbit uncontrolled before they could do anything about it and pieces were strewn across Australia so it's definitely something they need to control what are they going to do well they're going to put up some some other spacecraft to help it come down and you're absolutely right uh, in 2031 it's it's destined to uh, come down in a controlled manner and end up in somewhere they call the spacecraft cemetery uh, it's also known as the loneliest place on earth it's about 2700 kilometers away from the nearest land point if you want to know where that is on the globe uh, you've got south america so chile and you've got new zealand you go bang, basically bang in between those two and that's where that loneliest point is fascinating so with the iss gone then what more can we expect from the commercial sector in terms of space activities well, absolutely. So we've been talking a lot about getting astronauts up there. We've had China join the space race with their space station. We've got uh, some offerings that NASA have been looking around to give money to partnerships to actually come up with their own space station designs. And I think a while ago we chatted about Blue Origin's orbital reef concept. And there are others from Axiom Space, Nanorax and Northrop Grumman Systems Corporation. But at the moment, they're mostly in planning. But if there's one thing that we both know, Yvonne, it's that this race moves quickly. It does indeed. Meanwhile, a part of a SpaceX rocket, speaking of moving quickly, is due to crash into the moon. Not everyone's happy about it, though. Yeah, this is a little bit less planned and is definitely an example of something that we probably wouldn't like to see happen often. And in, in fact, as we start to move and populate the moon, we do actually need to have a better idea of what's up there and what can happen in this situation. But you're absolutely right. So in 2015, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket and it carried NASA's Deep Space Climate Observatory with the wonderful acronym of DISCOVER, if you don't use vowels. <laughs> and that was a probe and it went 1.5 million kilometres from Earth, so quite a long, long way away. But the upper stage of this rocket didn't get enough speed to actually go into orbit around the sun. And they really couldn't do anything about it. And the problem with these orbits is they're not as stable and comfortable as the ones that are close to Earth. And they get affected by the sun, the moon and Earth. And they get wobbled. And so those orbits can be kicked and what's actually happened with this particular 4,000 kilogram piece of rocket is it's actually going to smash into the moon. They estimate on March the 4th at a speed of about 9,000 kilometres an hour, or if you want this in seconds, 2.6 kilometres per second. Wow, that's really hard to imagine. 4,000 mm. kilograms. Just can't imagine it. Finally, how pleased should we be about confirmation that Earth has a second Trojan asteroid? I think from a science perspective, very pleased. Uh, if you like the idea of mining asteroids, which I'm not going to give you any philosophical comment on, then fantastic, because it's a lot easier to get to asteroids that are in Earth's orbit following or beh behind or in front of Earth uh, on Earth as it goes around the sun. A lot easier to get to than the other asteroids that are between Mars and Jupiter. So in one, in one way, we should be absolutely pleased. We shouldn't be worried about it at all. So what's a Trojan asteroid? Well, let's just quickly unpack that because Trojan sounds like, you know, a bunch of warriors are going to jump out of this asteroid on the dead of night and attack, but it's not really that big a deal. Uh, 
basically you can imagine gravity like a big stretch sheet of rubber and if you pull down that stretch sheet in a few areas like you know so hang something from underneath and you pop a marble on top you'd expect that marble to go into a hole but if you there are little places on that um, membrane where if you pop a marble it won't go anywhere and that's a stable point so if you imagine the sheet as kind of gravity there are stable points all around gravitational bodies and there's one bang in front of earth about 60 degrees around the circle and bang behind earth at 60 degrees so the trojan asteroids sit there they're fantastic for science because they might contain some of the most primordial chemicals elements and rocks from when the solar system was first built as always, Claire, thanks so much for explaining that so well to us. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Wonderful to see you, Yvonne.